We'll now dive into the reactions of esters, and we're going to start with organometallics, just like we did with the acid chlorides and anhydrides. And, uh, and just like with those, uh, we're going to use excess Grignard, because it's not going to just react once, it's going to react twice. Now, the first one is a substitution reaction, like we've seen with the acid chlorides and anhydrides, and the second one's going to be an addition reaction, and so you'll end up adding two equivalents of your Grignard end result. Unlike acid chlorides and anhydrides, though, uh, this will not react with lithium dialkylcuprates at any good yield, so we don't have a way to actually isolate the ketone. There's no great way to synthesize it with a Grignard and an ester. All right, now we'll take a look at hydride reductions, and we'll see some similarities here with acid chlorides and anhydrides. And if we add lithium aluminum hydride, so sodium borohydride not again reactive enough to react, but if we add lithium aluminum hydride, uh, it'll react once to produce the aldehyde and then react a second time to produce the alcohol. Now, we're going to break this bond right here again, so we actually end up with two alcohols. So one from the carbonyl side and then one from the leaving group itself. Uh, now, it turns out if we want to stop at the aldehyde, we do have a way to pull it off, but it's not the same as what we saw with anhydrides uh, and acid chlorides. We're going to use what's called dibo, or some people say dibol. Um, but that's diisobutyl aluminum hydride here. So a little bit different hydride reagent, special and specific, uh, selective for esters. And so if you want to turn an ester into an aldehyde, lithium uh, tributoxy aluminum hydride is not your choice. You want to use diisobutyl aluminum hydride instead. So finally, we'll look at the different inner conversions of the other uh, carboxylic acid derivatives. And notice we can't make the acid anhydride or the acid chloride directly. Since they're more reactive than the ester, we can only make either what's equally reactive, like the carboxylic acid, or what's less reactive, like the amide or carboxylate. Uh, one other thing to note, and I didn't have a great way to summarize it on this chart, but I'll remind you that you can also turn it into a different ester in a transesterification. Uh, cool. So nothing too special about this, more of the same. Notice for esters though, um, you can't just use a weak nucleophile. You're either doing acid catalysis, which I've highlighted in red, or you're using a strong nucleophile, which I've highlighted in blue. Um, one other thing to note, we are gonna pay particular attention to this reaction right here. Uh, we call it the basic hydrolysis of an ester, because uh, it has a special purpose as we'll see. So if we take a closer look at the basic hydrolysis of an ester, it initially starts to follow the strong nucleophile pattern. We'll find out one little distinction here. So we're going to do nucleophilic attack. The OH will now be attached. We'll have kicked up the uh, electrons to the oxygen here, those pi electrons, giving it a negative charge. But those electrons are going to come right back down and kick off the leaving group. But those aren't our products. Those are the normal two steps, but we haven't actually quite got our products yet. So here we've got a carboxylic acid. So, and then we've also formed the leaving group, which is an alkoxide ion. So, and in this case, the alkoxide is a strong base, the carboxylic acid's an acid. And so we're gonna do one final proton transfer here. So our alkoxide's gonna come and deprotonate uh, the carboxylic acid. And that's where you actually get your final products. So we do the same normal, you know, strong nucleophile mechanism, but because we formed a, two products, one's an acid, one's a base, you got one additional acid-base reaction going to occur. Uh, but that's how you get your carboxylate and your alcohol. Uh, and the reason I'm bringing this up, though, is that we have a special reaction that we call saponification. So that has some biological relevance here. So up here, I've kind of drawn a representation of a triacyl glyceride. Uh, it comes from a glycerol backbone. You can kind of see that highlighted in blue. And then three carboxylates, where R1, R2, and R3 uh, are generally pretty long fatty acid chains. Uh, if we react this with uh, excess hydroxide here, we'll hydrolyze each of these. So, and we'll end up going and breaking this bond here, this bond here, this bond here. And so we'll do this above uh, base hydro, uh, base, basic hydrolysis of an ester in triplicate. And so we'll form three carboxylates. So, and assuming R1, R2, and R3 are different, we get three different carboxylates. But if any of them are the same, obviously that reduces the number. So, and then instead of forming a single alcohol from the leaving group, we'd form a triol called glycerol. So, and the interesting part here. Uh, really comes down to these fatty acid carboxylates. They're polar at one end, nonpolar, big nonpolar chain at the other end, and they make great soap. So this might have been how your great grandma made soap back in the day. She would take lye, which is hydroxide salt, uh, and mix it with like pig fat or some other fat, um, 
and ultimately make these fatty acid carboxylates that function as soaps.